First of all, I would like to thank the National Museum, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, and my friend Jaco for being here. I'm sorry if I will be reading, but I have so many things to tell you that I'm afraid to lose my way if I don't follow my notes. This wonderful adventure started some years ago when a friend told me that a very talented photographer from Helsinki had a project of photographing Venetians in their homes and asked if I would agree to be one of them. Of course, I said yes, and Jaco came, met my mother, my sister, our dogs. We spent some, time, some interesting time together, and then he left. Less than two months ago, I received a phone call from the Istituto Italiano di Cultura of Helsinki, and a very kind lady, Minna, asked me if I could tell her the title of my speech on Venice, because they had to print the program for the museum. I thought it, thought it was a joke, thanked her, but I told her that for certain I was not the person she was looking for, since I'm not a historian, nor an artist, or a professor of anything. But she insisted that it was exactly me they were looking for. It was a great surprise, and I immediately said, yes, of course I will come and take my Venice to the far north. And here I am. One of my oldest dreams has always been to see Venice for the first time. Even today, I would love to feel that emotion of arriving by train or, or by car, getting on a boat, and slowly sleep on the Grand Canal, looking at the many wonderful palaces, one close to the other, growing out of the water and miraculously still there after so many centuries. Venice is a feeling, its light, its sounds, beauty all around. I think one should plunge into it and let it talk. In Venice, as you know, there are no cars. You walk, and walking you meet people, stop here and there, have a coffee or a glass with a friend. Time is dilated, is your pace time, and on the water it is some, sometimes slower. At the same time, in Venice you can always be on time, know exactly how many minutes you need to go from one place to the other. This habit of walking is, I think, one of the main differences between Venice and the other towns. Walking makes you share your way with others, makes you meet people you would not look for or call. It's like being always on a big stage where everybody sees you and from where you can see everyone else. Venetians always try to use side streets to avoid tourists. And in the narrow Calli, you can hear the sounds of everyday life coming from the houses, but also from your house, people chatting under your windows. And then there are the Campi, which in Italian is the same word as for fields. In fact, they used to be fields, or vegetable gardens, or simply meadows, up to the medieval times, when Venetians started putting bricks herringbone pattern to avoid the mud when it rained or when there were high tides. In the Campi, people meet, dogs run free, children play, their shape embrace you with their houses, shops, the chairs of the many cafes and restaurants, Often some trees and benches where people, old and young, sit to chat, eat a panino, read a newspaper, or just look around. But until the end of the 17th century, only very few streets and squares were paved. And all transports of both people and goods 
were made by rowing boats. This is the reason why the right point of view to admire the facades of the most important buildings is from the water. And now that we enter from the street doors, we only see the back of them. The noble families used to have private gondolas and gondoliers, as rich people in other places today have cars and chauffeurs. The palaces were at one time homes, offices, warehouses, and usually the many servants who lived there took the surname of the family they worked for. One of the last people to have her own private gondola and gondolier was Peggy Guggenheim, who died in 1979. The people we now call Venetians used to live on the mainland facing the lagoon since the 15th century before Christ and became part of the Roman provinces in the 2nd century BC. By the Roman time, there were many very rich towns in the Veneto area, like Aquileia, Heraclea, but the closest to the lagoon was Altinum, where the inhabitants, rich merchants, lived in their villas facing the water and used to trade all the goods arriving by ship towards northern Europe. In the 5th and 6th centuries, the barbarians' invasions pushed the inhabitants of the coast towards the islands of the lagoon, Torcello, Mazzorbo, Burano, Murano, and what now we call Venice. At the beginning they were poor fishermen, but they had very good skills and immediately started first of all compacting the soil the same way they used on the mainland that is putting long tree trunks very close one to the other vertically into the mud, covering them with three layers crossed of wooden boards and then, little by little, constructing on this base more and more refined buildings up to the ones we still see today. And despite this very long history, in Venice you don't see any ruins because all the materials were reused to construct new buildings. Only on some abandoned islands of the lagoon we can see some ruins of the past. The fixed date of birth of what was called the Repubblica di Venezia, until then under the Byzantine Empire, is the year 810. And this incredible and unique history ended in 1797 by the hands of Napoleon. Venice has been a very powerful state for almost 1,000 years. It had a very modern and complicated government which prevented the power to be held by only one person, the Doge, who was both the Prince of the Republic and the chief of the Church of San Marco, as the king in England, was elected by a complex nine-stage process to avoid any possibility of cheating, and his office was not hereditary. All the political offices were meant to serve the state, and only the very rich families could afford, for example, having a doge elected because he had to maintain himself and the Dogal palace until he died. The noble families were expected to build their palaces in different parts of the town in order to make them wealthier and more attractive. In fact, Venice doesn't have a real centre and we find very refined palaces in working class districts. Some of them you cannot even admire entirely because of their facades so huge on very narrow streets or canals. 
The history of my family crosses this history with capital H from the very beginning. Since the first mention we have about it is of a servo dio, which means servant of God, Grimani, who was known in town in the year 900. His name starts the family tree painted in the 18th century, to which I added the missing generations of our branch, the only one left. In it there are three doges, Antonio, here painted by Titian in front of Faith and St. Mark, Marino, in this painting by Veronese is receiving the gifts of the Persian ambassadors, and both these paintings are at the Dover Palace, and Pietro, several patriarchs, ambassadors, sea captains, and most of all merchants and patrons of arts, theatre and music. The last political office in my family was held by my great-grandfather Filippo Grimani, mayor of Venice from 1895 until 1919, re-elected five times for 24 years continuously. Under his city council, the first Biennale opened in 1895 and a big project of social housing started in town. I am the 30th generation. I was born in Venice. This is Jacob's painting. A uh, picture, sorry. I was born in Venice, went to school and graduated there, married a Venetian, and raised three children between Venice and its countryside. I really love my town and feel as being a part of it. My everyday life is shared between my family and three different occupations. The Friends of La Fenice Theatre, an association which organizes lectures on the operas of the season, musical travels, presentations of books on music and a piano competition called Premio Venezia, which in 32 years has become the most important in Italy. The Casa delle Parole, House of Words, which is a program of themed readings of literary texts from all over the world, read in the original language by native speakers with Italian translations. And what I call my real job, inside and around Venice, which is organizing special itineraries for small groups of guests in Venice and the Veneto area. Since I was a child, every time friends came and visit, it was a happy occasion to share my word with them. My parents were, and my 92 years old mother still is, very hospitable and curious to meet new friends. So we very often had guests staying at our house and sharing with us our everyday life. Since Venice is kind of a village, a small town where everybody knows each other, also my group of friends used to incorporate the new arrivals and open their homes, shared their boats, took them to their favorite sites or restaurants made them feel a part of something. Following this spirit, I started my actual job, made of meeting, sharing and involving friends to help the new guests discovering the most intimate and private sides of our town and of its country. Inside and around Venice means exactly this, Venice started from a flight from the mainland towards the lagoon and in the centuries went back to the mainland building some of the most beautiful and gentle villas in the world. This feeling a small part left over from a glorious past 
makes me feel great respect and responsibility towards this special town, its present and its future. And since I think we all should do something to preserve the things we love instead of only protest, the only thing I thought I know how to do is this. Since I had worked in the congresses and meetings organization since I was young, every itinerary I create for my guests is personalized, what we call tailor-made. And this first part of my job is very creative. I try to guess, after having asked a few questions, what would be the most astonishing things to do with each particular group of people, depending on their age, interests, if they have already been here, if they like something special, or if they absolutely don't want to do something else, and so on. The offer is so broad that usually I have to cut many of my suggestions, otherwise it becomes a rush from one place to the other and a fight against time. Instead, what is really important about Venice and its countryside is to enjoy its slowness, its silence, its atmosphere which is really unique. For example, retracing the path ancient people followed, we take boats from Altinum, crossing a short part of the northern lagoon, we arrive to a Valle da Pesca, which is a fish farm, where also the writer Ernst Hemingway, here in this picture with Giuseppe Cipriani, the inventor of Harris Bar, used to go hunting when he was in Venice, then to the island of Torcello, and from there through Burano, Mazzorbo, Murano, we arrived to Venice. This approach permits to understand much more of this incredible town and helps us appreciate better what we see in it afterwards. In these islands, there's a lot to see. The 1,000 years old cathedral in Torcello, the multicolored fishermen homes and the lace museum in Burano, the furnaces in Murano where also Tapio Vircala worked, and most of all, the nature of this side of the lagoon which is really unique. Unique and delicate. In the ancient times, the lagoon was like a lake, perfectly still and flat. Nowadays, the growing number of enormous cruise ships, during the summer also five or six a day, and most of all the motorboats and taxis, which run uselessly fast from one place to the other, raising waves which erode the mud of the emerged land and the poles under the buildings. This fragile equilibrium between nature and the work of so many generations is at risk. Venetians never take a taxi boat, since public water buses schedules are very precise and they are the preferred means of transport for everybody. I certainly am a very privileged person and one of my great privileges is to have had the possibility of constructing my job exactly around some of the things I'm more interested about. Discovering new sides of what is around me, art, architecture, handicraft, nature, history, and most of all, sharing it with who is looking for the same things. Because I realize that the kind of guests who ask our help in organizing their trips to Venice and the Veneto area are very similar to me. And a shared interest leads immediately to a sympathy, which many times has become 
a real friendship. My aim is to share with my guests all the visible and hidden treasures I know about this area and also the privilege of being connected with a big number of friends who live in wonderful buildings and work in order to preserve them. I always involve them in my itineraries, their homes, palaces, villas, their skills in glass, painting, fabrics, music, cooking, history, winemaking, restoring, writing, photographing, and usually at the end of the trip, our guests also feel they are a part of this group. The title of Yako's exhibition is Room Hidden by the Water. And also what I try to offer to my guests are emotions and feelings hidden by the water. We have to look for them behind the astonishing surface, which is the one that all the world knows and sees. The same kind of privacy of life behind the surface we can find among the friends who live in the countryside. The Veneto mainland is very gentle both as nature and as character of the people who live there. As an example, a tour of the villas designed by Andrea Palladio, the great architect of the 16th century, gives exactly this sensation. The buildings are perfectly in harmony with their landscape. Most of them were at one time the residence of the landlord and the center of his activities. The life of the landlord's family and of his peasants were very close and they still are. When we visit these beautiful places, we are captured by this harmony and we need to listen to the silence, smell the perfumes, admire the forms and the paintings of these fantastic artifacts before meeting the owners and have lunch or dinner with them in their beautiful dwellings. I had the great luck to spend all the summers of my childhood in a magic place called La Rotonda, built by Andrea Palladio starting in 1566, which belongs to my mother's family. We used to live there during our summer holidays with my grandparents. We were a lot of cousins and every day was a new adventure, running from one place to the other of the big house, up and down the eight stairs, reaching the fields through, through a very narrow, scary passage under the villa and really feeling free in the woods with pigs, cows, chickens, probably not realizing the privilege of being there, considering it just our grandparents' home. As it happens to me in Venice, when I think of La Rotonda, I can recall every single sound the different floors made when we walked. The sound of the bell my grandfather used to ring when lunch or dinner was ready. The crunch of the gravel under the wheels of the cars arriving slowly so as not to leave a track. And the fear when we children had to go to bed and the grown-ups stayed downstairs chatting in the living room. Since my grandparents died, La Rotonda is open to the public and nobody lives there anymore. Preparing these thoughts and memories for my friend Jaco and for you, I realized that my very fortunate way of living since I was a child, surrounded by beauty, is very difficult to communicate because it is made of many different impalpable sensations which words often don't reach. I hope anyhow to have succeeded in sharing with you 
the feeling of kindness, kindness and harmony which our surroundings transmit to the ones who are ready to listen. And I would like to quote a sentence I read this morning at the Chiasma Museum. We live in an emotion-glutted age. Our culture and media are saturated with tears, rage and pumped up buzz. All things are expressed in emotive terms. Art, too, can elicit powerful responses, yet it can also offer a subtler experience. Not everything has to be felt to the max. Sometimes it's enough to quietly listen. Thank you. Thank you, Donata, so much for this wonderful lecture and let us to glimpse those beautiful views and palaces you had in your pictures. It was amazing. Now, if anyone has some questions. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting presentation of Venice. I've been to Venice only once. It was long ago. Venice looked much better then. Uh, it was peaceful. Uh, as in your uh, presentation, you showed those uh, awful big ocean liners, how you can allow them to go to your beautiful city, help um, ruining it in, in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of people living in Venice and working in Venice very well for Venice. So. Um, also, this is a surface. I mean, there are two kinds of town. The, the one everybody sees, so that's why we should all, but I think this is everywhere, find our way to look for the things we love. And unfortunately, it seems that most of the people love that kind of things. Because also if all the shops sell horrible Chinese things for one euro, it means there are thousands of people who buy those things. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. So I think we must be the first to try and change this way of just giving away the, the most important things we have and give more importance to what is really important. So thank you for my sake as well. So you have had tourists in Venice since 18th century. Yes. So uh, uh, do you think there is some kind of special way of, of, of uh, communicating with tourists in Venice compared to let's say of, more modern of communicating communicating with tourists tourists in in your town and city because they've always existed there uh, well i think the tourists in the in the 19th century were very different from the tourists now and uh, uh, the number, what is really dangerous for Venice is the number, because Venice is very small and delicate. You cannot feel it more than some. Uh, so you have to stop at a certain time. Of course, you cannot close it. There are very many um, projects of putting taxes or, or a closed number, but I think that's impossible because how can you tell a person arriving to the airport, now you don't enter the town until in a week or... or. So to communicate, I think, is... But this is culture all over the world, is a way of communicating broader so that the people can understand also this fragility and not be taken off. You know that one of those ships keeps also, has also 6,000 people on. 
So it means that 6,000 people at one time get off the ships for maybe two or three hours and then get on again. They don't eat, they don't do anything in town because they have everything on their ship. So this is, the, uh, this is terrible because it doesn't have anything to do. They cannot even admire anything. They are like sheep and rushing from one. Yes, and they don't look anything because they're afraid to lose the person in front of them. So yeah, I think this is the... It's, it would not be so difficult to change, but uh, probably it's an economical problem. And, and uh, yes, 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 and it doesn't have anything to do with Venice because yes. that money doesn't arrive to Venice. You should build a plastic Venice. Yes, <laughs> there's also there is there is a project like that to build, <laughs> to build a false Venice in Marghera, that is the the ex industrial area that now is dismissed. And they were thinking of doing that because they think that very many of these people would not see the difference. <laughs> yes, we laugh, but unfortunately it is like that. They, it's impossible to be there for two hours and then uh, go away. I mean, it's better not to come. Better to stay half an hour here with me. <laughs> okay, I have a final question. If you get a very busy tourist who would wish to see such, just the one thing in Venice, what would be the place you would show? <laughs> one thing. Just one thing. What is the most uh, fascinating thing for you? That the you... night visit of St. Mark's Church. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.